As you know, we've been following this uh, series through this book, Understanding Creation, a new book that uh, is a little bit of a, uh, might say, a breakthrough uh, in terms of comprehension. Uh, I must say, personally, I had considerable difficulty writing it's chapter 11, uh, uh, simply because they say, you've got 2,400 words. And I said, well, I want to put some pictures in there. Well, you'll have to shorten up your text for the pictures. And I said, I want to put some references in there. They said, you, you have to count those. And uh, you understand my frustration. <laughs> now, <laughs> the, the good thing about this is that it's short enough that a person with ADT uh, <laughs> can, can follow it. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, this, I, I keep hearing, this is becoming an important factor in, in society now that uh, people uh, can't watch things too long, your videos can't be too long, and they have to be simple, and so on. So uh, I rejoice that we've got something here that is more palatable to, to the non-scientist. And it, it, this is really true for the whole book. It's fairly short, it's quite understandable. Uh, tends to be more declamatory than I wished because of that. Or you just make a statement and you don't have time to justify it, but uh, comprehensible and useful. And in this uh, <coughs> issue, uh, that is salient in the Adventist Church at present, and our educational institutions and so on. It's very important to have things that are comprehensible, uh, things that are, are easily accessible, and I, I praise this book for that. Uh, so many of our Adventist youth are leaving the church, more than half. Adventists born and reared in Adventist families leave the church. Uh, why? Part of the reason, of course, is they no longer believe the Bible. Uh, why do people not believe the Bible? Well, uh, one factor is science, which says, hey, uh, the Bible, that, that's, you know, that's just a story. Uh, but no one believes it hardly anymore. And uh, <coughs> the story of, well, uh, it was a flood. And Noah put all these animals in the ark and uh, <coughs> so on. Uh, it's not possible. It, uh, floods don't happen. Uh, worldwide floods? No, it's not possible. Uh, and you know, you go out there and you look at the mountains and a year later you look at the mountains at the same thing, nothing has changed. Uh, it's not hard to follow the reasoning of those who uh, think, well, no, that, uh, that's a made up story. Uh, why would all those animals go in the ark? There wasn't enough room. Uh, which is incorrect, and so on. Uh, <coughs> uh, but it, it is an issue in society, an issue in Adventism, that is very serious. Is the Bible true or isn't it? And that uh, the flood is part of the story. Seventh day, we're Seventh day Adventists, you know, part of our title. Seventh day, we're here because we believe in the six day creation. God did it all in six days. God said, Keep my Sabbath, for in six days I created, created heaven and earth and so on. It's all there in, in that, in that, uh, 
accounts, per se, and so on. Are you going to believe it or aren't you? Well, uh, if you look at the fossil record, <coughs> here you run into a basic issue related to whether or not the biblical account of creation is true. But the biblical model is, well, we've got uh, six days of creation. Uh, then the world goes bad. And then we have a flood. And then we have uh, <coughs> uh, waters receding and so on. Uh, and that all happened a few thousand years ago. And this is in contrast to these billions of years that the uh, scientific community proposes things evolve slowly and so on, no major worldwide flood type of thing. Well, uh, the problem lies in that when you look at the fossil record, the scientists examine these, they see that, hey, we have different kinds of organisms. Uh, uh, these are very GI layers out there. For those of you who've been in the Grand Canyon, uh, the Grand Canyon represents this part right here, <coughs> layers above and so on. Uh, the point I just want to make here is uh, you've got uh, different kinds of animals that only don't exist right now, uh, coal-forming uh, plants and so on lower down. You've got dinosaurs uh, higher up, and you've got mammals and flowering plants up here and they aren't down here. Now, if you put time in all these geologic layers, there's no way that God did it all in six days. Face it. You cannot put a six-day creation and put a lot of time, millions of years, between these various types, because you have different kinds of organisms at different levels. This is why this flood is so important. It is the event that reconciles the biblical account of six days with the fossil record. And so I was asked to uh, <coughs> write this paper or this chapter, this brief chapter uh, about uh, the flood and so on uh, for this book. And I, I did it, you know, glad I could do it. A uh, couple months later, got another request. Would I write another chapter about the flood for another book? 8,000 words. Ah, oh, boy, this, is, this was a different world for me, folks. <laughs> Previous one, 2,400. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, so I, I've written this one also. It's incidentally being published by the same publisher. I, uh, I presume they'll delay the publishing of this one for a while till the market is on the first one is saturated. But uh, <laughs> there are 16 authors in this book uh, right here. Uh, that title, whether they'll end up with that or not, I don't know. Publishers reserve the right to give whatever title they want to the book, what they'll end up with, I don't know. Uh, but it's edited by Brian Ball, who's been interested in this topic for years. I've had him on a few conferences. Uh, he was president of New Bowl Colleges for many years. He's retired now in Australia. Uh, but he, uh, a good scholar and so on, and he's put this together. And uh, <coughs> it's going to be put out eventually. So. Uh, historically, I might just mention, this is my third try at this. Uh, one of the more difficult episodes of my life was right here in Loma Linda, in the Griggs Hall, when I got a phone call from my boss, who told me, Ariel, we have a problem. This was in 1976. He said, we've got a problem. And you have no choice. 
you've got to write the Seventh-day Adventist commentary for the flood. And you have three weeks to do it in. I thought, I've got graduate students. I'm busy doing the research on coral reefs and so on. And so I, 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 there's no way I can do it. And he told me, you've got to do it. You have no choice. Uh, what had happened is that George McCready Price had written commentary. And they felt it was, it was published in 54, I think, 1954. And they felt that it needs updating and so on. And so they gave it to one person. And that person uh, turned it in. Committee went over it. Uh, uh, it's, it's not up to date. So they gave it to another person. Uh, and that person went over it. And uh, committee looked at it. Oh, he, he has not presented the admin's viewpoint. So three weeks left. Why? The, the five edition of the commentary is going to press on such and such a date. It's our only chance to revise this old manuscript. You've got to do it. And uh, I thank the Lord I did it. I, uh, I had a lot of stuff. I, uh, I'd been interested in this for quite a while. You know, a lot of quotations from Ellen White are in there and so on. And the geological, a lot, a lot of references in geology, but, and it's still there. So uh, when they asked me to do this one, cut it down to 2,400 words. Uh, this was almost as difficult. It's like writing an abstract. You know how difficult it is to write an abstract for a paper? It's one of the more difficult things you have to do after you write a paper is to write an abstract. Well, so I wrote an abstract. Uh, what, is the, what does the chapter cover? I'm not going to go into so many other details. I've covered many of these with you, but let's briefly go over it. Uh, <laughs> this is just the first part of it, incidentally. Uh, folk literature, interesting. Trench horse catastrophism. Uh, very interesting. I'm writing this for the educated layman in the Adventist Church. <coughs> Scientific behavior for engineers, right? Ocean sediments on the continents, abundant rabbit. We'll, we'll show you a few slides about this. And, uh, evidence for continental scale currents, widespread sedimentary deposits, flat gaps in sedimentary layers, incomplete ecological systems, and unusual coal deposits. And then at the end, uh, the last page, uh, I thought, you know, there is that scientific data. It doesn't relate directly to the flood. Uh, but it, it seems to suggest, hey, things haven't been around these billions of years. Uh, that is usually suggested by science. And so uh, I listed seven different things uh, that suggest, hey, these billions of years are not correct. Uh, you were raised to rabbit with you, carbon 14. Uh, you thank Paul Geem for that. <coughs> uh, the good archaeological evidence is recent. Human population is too small. Mutations too abundant. Soft tissue in ancient fossils. Geologic time too short for evolution. Uh, maybe you want the lights off a little bit. You can see a little better. Just, uh, <coughs> And I'll take a little drink of water here. <clears throat> okay, let's go on with this. <clears throat> Introduction. Uh, I'm going to read you about three or four paragraphs from the book, uh, simply because they, they cover exactly what I want to say. Uh, and this is uh, <coughs> the flood described in Genesis is both momentous and astonishing. The Bible devotes three chapters, entire chapters, to describing it, longer than two narrating the creation account. Uh, this is an important issue. <coughs> 
and uh, we can find significant authentication for the flood beyond the biblical account. I, I did not appeal to the Bible in, in the book. Uh, I assume that that part would be taken care of in other chapters. <coughs> In a biblical context, the Genesis flood event reconciles a recent creation with <coughs> the majority of the worldwide fossil record, which is what I discussed with you a few minutes ago. Some suggest that the Genesis flood was a local event, or that it only produced a small portion of the fossil record, but such suggestions do not agree with the biblical account, indicating that all the high mountains and the whole heavens were covered. And are we going on with this? Moreover, Unless conditions are very different from the ordinary, it seems unlikely that major portions of the fossil record could have formed in a relatively short time before and after the flood. And there are alternative interpretations to this. Uh, uh, <coughs> you know, the biblical model appears to be a recent 60s creation and a catastrophe work counting for much of the fossil record. This model stands in stark contrast to the Levinasher model of the fossil record representing gradual evolution during over the billions of years. So just trying to set the stage here in a few words about this, uh, this controversy. So let, let's just briefly go over, the, over the, the, some of the points I'm making in, in the book. Uh, these illustrations are not there. I was only allowed, I, well, I could have put in all illustrations and no text, but uh, I put in one illustration, one table. Uh, <coughs> I had to keep it short. Uh, this is a, just a picture where the, of the world and the dots show where there are flood stories. Now, the, uh, they're all over the world. And some say, well, uh, we had a local flood here. When that happened, they didn't know any better because they didn't have uh, their iPhones. And uh, <laughs> so they, they figured it was universal. So, it got put into the literature as universal. And so you can say, well, these are all local floods. There's an unusual amount of, of material at the local floods. Well, uh, several years ago, I went down to UCLA to find a book. Uh, it's over at UCR now, incidentally, if you're looking at it. And that is this book here, uh, Steve Thompson's uh, Motif Index. <coughs> folk literature, and I started counting uh, the different kinds of end of the world, or I shouldn't say end of the world, uh, calamities, excluding end of the world, uh, in, in that motif index for, for these calamities, and I was struck by the number of flood stories that were. And uh, you, get the, the, you have the figures right here, 122 for the flood, fire 19, continuous winter, and so on. Uh, this motif index incidentally, is six volumes. The guy has divided the folk literature of the world into 33,000 different categories. And uh, these are the ones, uh, these are from the categories dealing with, with world calamities. And dominance of the flood, I mean, just you know, unbelievable. You don't have to put this to a statistical test, you know. This, this is not marginal data that you have to put, to, 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 I mean, just look at it. Furthermore, this challenges this idea, hey, th these are not just local floods. Uh, if it had been local floods, you'd expect all kinds of catastrophes, or, or I shouldn't say local floods. <laughs> these should not have been local catastrophes of one type or another. You'd have all kinds of, that. they don't even mention earthquakes here. Uh, pestilence not mentioned, droughts not mentioned. Uh, and the next one below is, you know, uh, fire 19. Uh, if there had been lots of local f catastrophes over the world, we'd expect, you know, a fairly even distribution of different kinds of calamities. Uh, it looks like the reason this figure is so high is because it's based on a real event over the world. Uh, people are aware of this. The, the, uh, speaking of the Grand Canyon, I have a Supai Indians. The Hualapai Indians, Navajo Indians, they all think the Grand Canyon was the result of a major catastrophe, w washing out from a flood, cut that Grand Canyon and so on. Well, maybe we can talk about the Grand Canyon sometime later. Uh, one of my favorite topics lately. Anyway, uh, 
Th then uh, another factor, the scientific community has been moving towards catastrophism. This has been a great help for us in that th they're not saying flood, world flood at all, but they're saying catastrophes. And uh, here in the, book, in the journal of science, so on, this comment here is a great philosophical breakthrough for geologists to accept catastrophe as a normal part of Earth history. See, there, there's this change took place about 1960, and uh, now catastrophes occur, and their data, you know, fits nicely with the flood. Uh, another uh, quotation from your Barrett Ager, uh, hurricane, the flood of the tsunami may be during an hour or a day in the ordinary process of nature to achieve. You see, this was the breakdown of the old uniform Terran idea, Every, all changes had to go slowly. Now the scientific community was stepping in fact, hey, uh, some of these can, can go rapidly. Periodic catastrophe, catastrophe may have more effect than all the vast periods of gradual evolution. You know, this person believes in long ages and so on, but uh, hey, this is, this is where you get results. Uh, well, scientific evaluation and genesis flood. Quickly go over some of the few points I've made. Uh, <coughs> for instance, marine, so much marine material on the uh, uh, continents. What's it doing there? We expect marine material in the oceans. Uh, and I'll make a, a short point of this, but I'm showing you a few, few pictures to illustrate the point. Uh, <coughs> and the quotation here from uh, Shelton, marine sedimentary rocks are far more common widespread in land today than all other kinds of sedimentary rocks combined <laughs> this is one of those simple facts that fairly cry out for explanation and that lie at the heart of man's continued effort to understand fully the changing geography of the past. Let me tell you, if you believe in the biblical record, it's not crying out for explanation. What's all that marine material on the continents for? There was a flood. Continents sank down. Material from the ocean came on the continents more abundant there than all the other kinds of sedimentary rocks combined. Not where it should be, but where you'd expect it if there was a worldwide flood. Well, uh, example uh, here, Grand Canyon. This layer is marine, this layer is marine, this layer is marine. Uh, this layer is partly marine, mostly marine, gets less marine through here. Uh, this one's considered to be more river, lake type of deposit. This one is supposed to be wind deposited. Uh, Leonard Brand is here. He knows more about that thing than I do. And uh, <coughs> uh, then you have marine and marine. You know, three quarters of your layers there are marine. Awful lot of marine material on the continents. What's it doing there? This is the Grand Canyon, you know, hundreds of miles away from the ocean. Well, uh, then a lot of evidence underwater activity. Another point I make in the book. Uh, and here are turbidites. Uh, Ventura Basin here in California. Uh, each turbidite here is about a foot thick. It produces many layers. When you have many layers, a single event. Turbidite laid down rapidly. I don't have time to go into the details how this happens, but it's a very rapid action and so on. Uh, evidence of underwater activity. And you have turbidites well represented uh, all over the world on the continents. Uh, for instance, here, this is in Switzerland. Switzerland landlocked way there in uh, <coughs> kind of the middle of Europe. And uh, each one of those layers is a turbidite. Uh, then you have our, our Chadwick's work uh, here on the mm -hmm. directionality. You've got, <coughs> for instance, uh, he studied the direction in the Paleozoic. He uh, did it in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic also. Uh, but this is for the Paleozoic of the direction sediments were laid down. You can tell this by a number of characteristics. And uh, uh, this is based on uh, 319,000 samples from the literature. I mean, this is not superficial data. Uh, <coughs> And uh, you can see dominant direction here. Looks like a major catastrophe. Keep in mind, 
on the uh, North American continent right now. Uh, water is flowing and depositing sediments into lakes in all directions, all kinds of directions, so on. Here, we have this very dominant southeast, in general, uh, southwest uh, uh, direction. So that's, keep that in mind. That this is what uh, uh, you deal with. The data that, you know, fairly convincing the past is very different than the present. Uh, and then, then extremely widespread layers. Well, th this is unbelievable. You go out there and you look at these layers, you don't realize that these things are spread over extremely widespread areas. This is uh, Steinacker Lake in Utah. <coughs> you got several formations there. This is the Frontier Formation. That unit up there spread over 300,000 square kilometers. That's more than a, the area of a state. <coughs> Maori formation, the grayish layer right there, 250,000 square kilometers. This little thin white layer right there. The Dakota spread over 815,000 square kilometers over many states. How do you spread a thin layer? This thing's only about 30 meters high, you know, 100 feet thick, 100 feet thick. Has some subunits and so on. It's a complicated picture a little bit. But man, how are you going to spread a layer that thin over such a wide area? You're going to have to have a flat area that big to spread it on, to start out with. I mean, this is I mean, totally different. What you, you can never spread a layer like that over the Earth at present. Now, everything goes up and down, you know. We're talking about 815,000 square kilometers, uh, six or seven states uh, uh, here in the Western United States. It's such a different world out there when you look at these layers. Uh, Morrison, for, uh, let me back up here. Uh, this one here, the uh, Cedar Mountain, a little less, 130,000 square kilometers. Then you got the Morrison Formation right here. Uh, it goes down a little below water level there. Uh, average about 100 meters in thickness, spread over a million square kilometers. Here, here's a map of the distribution of the Morrison Formation. Goes from Texas clear up into Canada. Uh, you have to have flat areas to deposit these. If you have a single river cutting through this over time, you know, it was about, you'd not get, you could not spread the unique layer over that widespread area. I mean, we're talking catastrophic activity beyond what you can imagine. And some geologists have recognized this to a certain extent, although they're not very popular. Uh, I'll refer to one quotation about this anyway. But then another point is when you look at uh, these various layers, they're so flat out there. Flat. When you look at the present erosion, this is the Colorado River in <coughs> eastern Utah. Notice how irregular erosion is. Contrast between present erosion and those widespread layers tells you again, we're dealing with a, a world that is totally different than what uh, we have out there now. Uh, going on with this, a uh, little bit of a complicated diagram. I did not put that diagram in the uh, book, incidentally. Uh, I slipped it in the other one. Uh, the newer book is coming out. <coughs> This tells you that just exactly what I'm talking about. But it's, it's a little bit complex. Let me just take a minute or two to say something about this. This is a diagram of the geological layers out there. It's a diagram of those geologic layers northeast of the Grand Canyon. It represents 133 kilometers across from left to right there, <coughs> uh, southwest, northeast. And uh, the white represents the rock layers, okay? White represents the rock layers. Uh, 
they actually sit on top of each other. Now, throughout the world, parts of the geologic column are missing, and those are illustrated here by the black lines across, the big wide black lines across. And the thicker the line, the more of the geologic column that is missing. You've got your time, this column right here, in millions of years. This is 500 million, 400 million there, and so on. Friends here between uh, this layer and that layer. Over 100 million years of the geologic column is missing. Now, when you have a 100 million years of the geologic column missing, you'd expect a lot of erosion in 100 million years. In fact, you'd expect two miles of it, three kilometers of it, on average, for the continents of the world, you'd expect th three kilometers of it. Look how flat that line is. This other layer sits on top of it, it's flat. Uh, and then you've got shorter periods here and so on. But these gaps are based on the fact that in other parts of the world, you've got layers that took that long, according to their interpretation, to, to develop. Here they aren't here. So you've got these flat gaps. And uh, now, the clincher in all this is what's the present topography? Well, uh, all these, there's tremendous lateral compression here. Uh, we, so that I don't fit on a piece of paper. But uh, all these layers are only about three and, a, three and a half kilometers thick. 133 uh, kilometers across that way. Present topography in the region illustrated by two lines here. I took the flattest line I could think of, which was along Interstate 70, right across that area. And it's this dotted line right here. You can see it down here, cutting down, up and down, through these various formations. And then I took another line, a little bit south of there, uh, which wouldn't be the flattest. Uh, and you can see uh, it's, it's a solid line right here, it goes up and down, up and down through here. Uh, the, the question is, and it's, it's simply, it's there before you. Here is present erosion. Notice how irregular present erosion is. Here are these layers. Gaps. Why are these gaps so flat when you have such normal, irregular erosion? It doesn't look like 100 million years ever took place here. It looks like these were laid down rapidly with a little time. And this is fairly nicely with, with the flood. Uh, flood model, very nice labor that fact, in fact. Well, uh, just a couple of examples here from Grand Canyon. I mean, you've seen this before, but 100 million years right there. You know, that, that's that great big line, thick line I showed you in that last slide. It was a thick black line in that black slide right there. <coughs> Here's 14 million years through there. Uh, those things are hard to find, very hard to find, I might state. Uh, this one easier, right at the bottom of the white layer, six million years. You expect normally at least 600 feet of erosion uh, during that time according to average rates of erosion for the continents of the world. Uh, look how flat that is. So we've got uh, fairly compelling evidence. Uh, hey, the past is very different and it sure fits very nicely. What do you expect during the flood? Now, we'll go to Grand Canyon West. Uh, some of you know we took a group to the Grand Canyon West. It's so fascinating to get there. I hadn't been there in my life before. And <laughs> got to study it out ahead of time and so on. And the very same layers we showed you in the last, <coughs> this is a little further down and so on. Uh, but do you remember that 100 million year gap that I talked to you in the last one? It's, it's over here also. The same layers, uh, a slightly different terminology, but it's right at the end of this arrow right here. 
See the whitish layer across? Follow it all the way across here. That's where it is, right there. A hundred million years, no erosion. You do find some erosion, a little bit. Don't get the idea. Don't say there's no erosion. There's some erosion there. Very little and extremely minor compared to what you'd expect in a hundred million years. Well, ah, another part, Grand Canyon West. Your, your, your layers are laid out. Uh, it takes you a while to work out these things, I might say. And uh, I was so pleased I had the time to do it. Uh, but here's that 100 million year gap right there, right? At the base, it's the whitish line right there, right at the base, right, right through there, uh, right above the Grand Wash, which is a formation there that usually included in the Moab. But, uh, it's probably not a formation, but that's what it's called uh, by some geologists who studied the area, per se. And they admit, hey, hey, we've got 100 million years here in some place. We can't even find out where these gaps are, type of thing. And you've got the river, Colorado River, down here, and on its way to uh, Lake Mead. As they say, uh, Colorado, it's, it's too thick to drink and too thin to plow. <laughs> and that is cer certainly the truth. But it, uh, keeps carrying sediments on down into, uh, into Lake Mead. And up here, you, you got the, right, that six million year gap I showed you in the last one. It's right there. Uh, the 14 million year gap is somewhere in these layers. This has not been worked out. It's, uh, uh, it's there, but uh, exactly where you can't tell. And the fact that you can't tell where these gaps are, you know, this is significant, 14 million years. You'd expect at least, you know, 500 meters of, of erosion uh, in that time and so on. Uh, go to uh, northeastern Utah. Uh, you have the uh, Morrison Formation right here. Uh, and you've got a, what is called the Cedar Mountain Formation and the Dakota Formation. Now, I mentioned the Morrison and those three in that picture I showed you earlier were talking about these widespread layers. Uh, here's a 20 million year gap, notice how flat that is. And you go here, and this picture I got to put in the book. Uh, they cut out part of it and so on, but uh, you have the, the, very, the very same gap that we have here. And we're 350 miles south of there. Uh, 40 million years. Uh, the Dakota sitting right on top of the Morrison, very flat, and of course that that little thin white layer there spreads for 815,000 square kilometers. Uh, that little whitish layer, that's the Dakota, uh, same as you saw uh, several slides back and so on. So uh, <laughs> after a while, when you study these very formations and You've been driving for a couple of days and you have the same formations and same gaps and everything is there. You say, hey, the past must have been very different than it was at present. And uh, uh, it wasn't that much time as you'd expect for a worldwide flood. And the uh, uh, Coconino Sandstone, uh, this whitish layer right here. And Leonard has done a lot of research here uh, on this thing and uh, tracks are there. and. Uh, Thanks to him, I have this slide uh, of tracks in the Coquinino. It looks like they were made in mud, not in dry sand. And uh, I could tell you more stories about that, but I, the point I want to make here is not uh, uh, that, but the fact that <laughs> when we look through the Coquinino, you have thousands of these trackways. They're usually in the lower half of the Coquinino. And animals, we've not found the animals, and no one's found a plant. What did these animals, it's you know, maybe six million years supposed to have been, six million years, animals, tracks, no plants. What did the animals eat? A uh, little problem here. Uh, Go to the museum in Vienna, the Natural History Museum in Vienna, you find the protoceratops. Uh, note the teeth 
here. Flat teeth. This is a herbivore. Uh, here's a statement from uh, Paleo, General Paleo. The abundance of an unambiguous herbivore, Protoceratops, just the, it's, a, it's a dinosaur, it's only a couple meters long. <coughs> and a rich trace fossil fauna, probably tubes made by insects, if you read the rest of the article, <coughs> reflect a region of high productivity. That means a lot of food was produced. That's what we mean when we say high productivity. <coughs> the absence of well-developed plant colonization is therefore anomalous and baffling. Another case like the Coconino. Hey, where's the food for these guys? Now you go to the Morrison Formation, you've got the same problem. You find a few plants in the Morrison. But what fed those huge dinosaurs that are so abundant in, in the Morrison's plant? Uh, Animals need plants to survive, but few plants were found, and so on. Then we got coal, uh, unusual coal deposits around the world. Uh, this is 400 feet high. Here are some power line poles and so on for scale. Uh, the amazing thing about this is these layers right here that you see, white lines. This is transport. This is sediment. This is water deposit. This is not coal that grew there according to the standard interpretation for coal. This is transport. And huge uh, deposits of coal. This is Australia. And uh, again, you know, talking of the data that, that fits nicely with, with the, the flood. And then you look at some of these coal deposits. And th this is in uh, Utah. Uh, Castle Gate. It, within those coal seams, you find partings. Well, and that's a layer of sediment mixed in with the coal. You got coal below here and coal above. And you got this thin white line. You can follow it all the way through here. Uh, parting. This is water deposited for us. The, the, uh, and, uh, you know, when you go to uh, Kentucky, and examine some part. They've got a part in there that's about four centimeters thick, and down to down to one and a half centimeters to four centimeters thick. Spread over 1,500 square kilometers. How are you going to spread a thin layer like that over 1,500 square kilometers under ordinary conditions? You have to have extremely flat conditions that are extremely powerful. Uh, forces to spread a layer over 1,500 square kilometers in extremely unusual conditions again. This is what seems to fit so nicely with the flood. So, you know, uh, there is, one does not have to give up his scientific integrity to believe the Bible, folks. There's significant data there that, that supports uh, the Bible. Well, uh, quickly, over the, uh, <coughs> the last part of the, uh, <coughs> of the book, that one page that I put in there, because data that challenges the long ages. This is not evidence for the flood, per se. This is evidence that these billions of years are not correct. Uh, and uh, <coughs> erosion. Uh, here's a river eroding sediments. Uh, after a flash flood there, you know, Boulders are running through there and so on. Uh, this stuff eventually ends up in the ocean. And, uh, but erosion is way too fast. Average rates of erosion are way too fast. Uh, you'll have to reference, you'll have to look at some of my books uh, to, to get the data on that. But it, uh, at least, the continents at least should have been eroded away 100 times during their supposed geologic age. That's a conservative figure. Uh, probably more like two to three hundred. Uh, uh, then you look in some coal seams like these here in uh, Utah, in the Black Hawk Formation, and uh, <coughs> Castle Gate. And what do you find in there? These are supposed to be 70 million years old. Carbon-14, that is a half-life of 5,730 years should not be present there, 
should have disintegrated a lot ago. This is a case where carbon-14 is disproving these long ages. You find carbon-14 there, dates around 50,000 years, maybe according to uh, the assumed concentration of carbon-14. It's there. Uh, and uh, Paul here has uh, done the, the seminal work on that thing. Uh, as an article about at least 70 samples like this. This is not just one odd case, folks. Uh, it suggests maybe that that was the level of carbon-14 before the flood, this having been uh, deposited during the flood. Look how flat those layers are, incidentally. Uh, this is not growth, this is transport. Uh, and then we have ancient man, events uh, for ancient man. Yeah? The good archaeological uh, evidence for, for ancient man is recent. Man hasn't been around here that long, uh, according to standard interpretation. Homo sapiens has been around for maybe 500, 200 to 500,000 years. Uh, the genus Homo for 2 million years. Uh, but when we look around, uh, what do we find? We find pyramids that are recent. Uh, we find aqueducts that are recent. We find uh, dwellings like this, Mesa Verde. 1,300 years old, uh, and so on. If man has been around here for, let's be conservative, 200,000 years, how come all the good evidence for him, like writing and history and pyramid and so on, is recent? Uh, no, uh, there's good data to support the Bible. But the human population growth rate. Uh, here's your one million year BC. Uh, here's the size of the human population. Uh, and so on. This is taken from Scientific American. Uh, notice the, the difference in the change of the curve here. Such a Sharp change demands an explanation. Uh, it would seem men discovered sex. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you, animals discovered it long before men, according to the evolutionary model. Uh, the, uh, so you, you have, we're growing at a tremendous rate. We're doubling our population every 100 years uh, <laughs> as a very minimum, you know, 30 to 100 years, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, we should have filled the earth a long time ago if, we, if the time was there, a long time ago. Uh, then then the, this question of, we've been discussing during this class at times, uh, but mutations, a new baby, has about 60 mutations that its parents did not have. How has the human population ever survived at that great degradation? I'm not talking about any evolution here. I'm talking about just plain degradation of the genome. And uh, scientists have discussed this and so on. It doesn't look like man has been here that long, according to the, the, the dates that they proposed and so on. And then there's uh, Schweitzer's work on the uh, dinosaurs, what dinosaurs, 70 million year old dinosaurs. Here's a blood vessel uh, uh, from that and uh, some dark blobs that could be a blood vessel, I mean uh, blood cells and so on. But she found soft protein there and soft protein is not expected to last anymore. Maybe uh, 100,000 years. This is 70 million years, uh, 78 million years. Uh, soft tissue. Uh, and then you, you go, this is a factor on the other side, and it's, it's challenging the evolution model per se, but it is just so that the, the scientific model is not working. And that is that the rocks down here, for instance, are supposed to be 1.8 billion years, and you go down further and so on, then maybe. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and so on. Uh, 
give them all this time they have, or take 15, uh, 10 to 15 billion years for the universe. Take a, you had no time for evolution. The model does not work. It suggests, you know, the creation and so on. Uh, we're going in a different direction here as far as time is concerned here. They don't have enough time for, for that to have occurred. Well, I uh, <coughs> want to go on with just a couple other points. One, uh, this is quoting from the, uh, the book right here, uh, Understanding Creation. Uh, this is the last paragraph. The ignorant body of scientific data is quite difficult to explain unless one believes the biblical uh, flood model. Uh, this should be a capital F there. Uh, I think what happened, is I capitalized biblical and I capitalized flood, and they, they took out both. And, but all the other floods in the chapter are capitalized. Anyway, uh, you know, these are things that you fool around when you're an author and that deal with editors. Uh, not very important. Uh, the folk literature, geological data, other corroborating scientific data, and the Bible itself all authenticate that astonishing catastrophe, the Genesis flood. Now, uh, as an addendum, this is where the chapter ends. Uh, I have, of course, references. Uh, well, I don't know who had to go through all these. Uh, Tom Mothy and uh, we talked about that. Shadow, we talked about it. Brett Carlton. This guy talks about these tremendously widespread layers. Uh, uh, Dodson, dinosaur business, Jurek Martin, he's talking about the uh, lack of food for dinosaurs and so on. Uh, flat gaps, here you've got uh, <coughs> challenge to the long geologic ages. A uh, couple articles, I could get I could listen much more for this. Uh, uh, just uh, when you can't put it in a chapter, you think it'll be too complex, you put a, make a footnote for it. You know. uh, White, more talking about the dinosaurs, the details are, this is deals with incomplete ecological systems. Uh, Grand Canyon, uh, Smithsonian, this is, oh, in fact, no fossils, no plant fossils found in the Coconino. Uh, Austin, uh, that's about that, I think that very cold parting and so on more here. Uh, calculations, if you look in those pages, you find erosion rates, uh, 14 references you'll find there. Couldn't put them in this chapter. Uh, give you a seminal article here on this in uh, Origins on residual carbon-14. So carbon-14 is challenging the standard utilized time scale. Uh, rates of human production, I talked about that. So uh, Schweitzer, the uh, uh, dinosaur found with uh, soft blood vessels, and, and, and here's something that has to do with uh, billions of years too short for, for, uh, for uh, evolution type of thing. So th this is uh, where it lies here. I want to mention two Bible texts and then one incident in connection with this as we close. Uh, this is all we went through, all this evidence. I'm not going to read it to you again. We've gone through it. Uh, and uh, here, here's the uh, other points that we made uh, in the chapter, all compressed, I might state. Uh, but I did want to emphasize again this, this point that uh, this situation where science no longer believes in creation, science no longer believes in the flood, was predicted by Peter in the second period of 3, 3, 6. We mentioned this before, uh, but he says in the last days, he's talking in the last days right here, uh, which we think is now, it's willing and ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, which is creation, and the earth standing out of water, suggests that the earth came out of water. Uh, this may be Genesis 1, verse 1 to 3. Uh, and then water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
they're going to be willingly ignorant in the last days that the world being overflowed with water perished. See, 2,000 years ago, Peter predicted this thing. Uh, and uh, this chapter tries to point out that uh, maybe there was a flood. And then, of course, Romans 1, 20 to 22, very perceptive uh, chapter relating to this whole thing. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world, this is referring to God. I understood by the clues that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. In other words, you gradually let God, supremacy, be decreased, very dangerous way to go. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Your intellectual pride gets the best of you, and you, you think you're smarter than Moses when he wrote Genesis, or God when he said he did it in six days, or Christ when he referred to creation, and so on. And their foolish hearts were dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Paul does not mince any words here as to the route you go down when you follow this, this pathway. Well, uh, lastly, I just want one little sidelight here. Uh, Jeff Sonntag, uh, who, uh, to whom we're so grateful for recording these things, uh, passed this quotation on, on the internet, and I was struck by it. Don't overdo or what we're talking about here. Uh, the incident took place on uh, September 20, 1909. Uh, Loma Linda here at this university is wondering whether they should start a medical school. And uh, what kind of medical school should they have? Should it be homeopathy? Uh, should it be just uh, taking care? Should it be accredited? And so Burden, John Burden, who's kind of running things here, uh, went up to Santa Elena, uh, well, a uh, sanitarium actually, uh, right near Santa Elena, to talk to Ellen White about it. And Willie White, her son, was also there. And uh, interestingly, they got into geology. I realize that my, my bias towards geology is going to show up here. Uh, but he just happened to introduce his comments about geology. And I thought, how fascinating here that uh, Loma Linda is here. And here, here we've got the Geoscience Research Institute here. I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, in this conversation, they, they were burdened one to know, hey, what, what, Ellen, what, what, what should we do at Loma Linda? And she was clear, you need to have physicians, you need to have accreditation, you need to fit into the laws, and so on, uh, uh, rules, and so on, respected, physicians need to be respected, and so on. Um, but he, uh, Willie White comes up with this little interesting comment. He says, we don't have to teach those subjects in their way. He's speaking about the two world views here, uh, the following the Bible or following secularism. <coughs> we can teach them in our way. When it comes to the study of drugs, they teach how to give them. We teach dangers and using them and how to get along without them. And then he throws in, I don't know why. He's just talking. They're talking about the whole minute here. He says, uh, in some other schools, they teach geology on the evolution basis. We can teach geology so that evolution is false, which is what this book is trying to do here, of course. Uh, well, Ellen White says, and she did not address that in geology herself. She said, you must plan these details yourselves. This, is a, this, this statement follows this one, and I presume this is a, a sequence. Uh, I have told you what I have received, but these details you'll have to work out for yourself. And what she has received was, no, you must have physicians that are respected by society. <clears throat> and so on. Well, and then uh, emphasize here, all I can say is that I have had very distinct light. We can our powers by not placing our dependence upon God. Now, as far as geology being here uh, at Loma Linda, you know, Ron Numbers wrote this book, uh, The Creationist. And uh, he there makes a statement that I, already wrote, 
moved, moved the Geoscience Research Institute to Loma Linda. Now, let me tell you something. I did not move the institute to Loma Linda. Ron Numbers is not incorrect. I wrote all the letters I could to make sure it was moved to Loma Linda. But uh, I think the decision was made by the president of the General Conference and the president of Loma Linda University. And they decided, yeah, geoscience research. It was at Andrews. Seminary was there. Seminary was not making any scientific contributions. Our numbers were few. We need to have all the scientific acumen, all the scientific attitude we could have. And I, I was in charge of the biology department here at uh, Loma Linda. And we were associated with the basic science folks. And we were profiting from all the research they did. They knew what research was about and all this stuff. And I thought, the library here had a lot of stuff. The bi bi library at Andrews didn't. Uh, you've got to move this thing here. Besides, we have the graduate program that gives the only PhD in the world that gives a, uh, uh, a degree with, in a creation perspective. Uh, so why not move geoscience here? And these folks decided, and before I knew it, it was here. Uh, so uh, just a little interesting sidelight. Uh, it's interesting to me that the Geoscience Research Institute is here, and of course, uh, Earth and Natural Sciences is here, and so on. Our numbers are few, but we're making a significant contribution uh, to, this, to this whole area, and I'm glad for the Lord's blessing in this direction. So, fine. Keep the faith. There's a lot of scientific data that supports the Bible. Okay, Paul. Yeah. Um, before we... I take questions and comments. I'll point out that it is 11.30. I know some of you have other places that you need to be. But uh, we'll continue the questions and comments until Dr. Roth gets tired of them. So. I would like to say that uh, I have listened to you many times. You're always your... Uh, Comments are powerful, but today you have exceeded and excelled your your old past performance. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for your comments, folks. All the goodness we have comes from God. Keep that in mind. Well, we know that. <laughs> now, uh, there is a Chinese saying that. Uh, an illustration is worth a thousand words. I would like to modify this. I think based on what I have seen today, illustrations may be worth 10,000 words. Okay. Because I've read and I've listened to you and to Paul Gim many times, but the illustrations that you presented today are really invaluable. Uh, it, 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 uh, they impress me more than anything I have seen before from you or from anybody else. And I was wondering if you would consider, or maybe you have done this and I'm not aware, but are you considering publishing all those illustrations together with the comments that you have made today? Yeah. Well, they're going to be available right off for our educational folks. In a uh, search, I've got over a thousand slides of material, reference material for Adventist teachers, Adventist students. Uh, Elder Blackmer promised, uh, Dr. Blackmer promised that they're going to put them in several resources areas. One at Southern, they have a research area for, for science and religion at Southern Adventist University. Uh, there is Circle, that's an Adventist resource area. Uh, these are all going to be available in a few weeks. I, I'm just about done with it. Okay, uh, I would like to add something else. You, you did mention that uh, the sediments go out to the ocean. Now, as I look at some of these impressive, impressive, maybe they are so impressive because the pictures are large, 
big. Now, as I look at those s layers, going for, according to evolution, is for billions of years, then I'm forced, if I accept evolution, I'm forced to admit that for billions of years, the face of the Earth was flat. Now, if the sediments go to the ocean, let's say today, if today the local events flooding events, would they ever produce something like that? Going for miles and miles and miles, you know, of layers yeah. without hardly any erosion. So, is, are we assuming that the oceans at one time, they were all flat? Uh. On which model are you in? Well, <laughs> I'm wondering yeah. how yeah. evolutionists can explain the data. Because yeah. Yeah. if sediments from okay. local catastrophes, from yeah. local floods, go to the oceans, then we are supposed to assume that yeah. the oceans were at one time all flat, yeah. large portions, okay. huge portions of the oceans were flat, and they were elevated somehow miraculously. Okay. Um, let me make this statement. The flattest sedimentation areas we know of are in the oceans, okay? Uh, in the abyssal plains of the oceans, okay? You've got their very slow sedimentation, very flat sedimentation. None of the layers I showed you there are from deep ocean. You can tell by the kind of fossils you have and so on. These were all shallow marine or, or terrestrial layers, okay? So it's anomalous. It is definitely anomalous. Could, could the, uh, these all have been in the ocean and then uplifted? Uh, I think probably that's what happened during the flood because the continents were lower down. Now, that's just one model. Keep in mind, we're, we're not on top of this flood model thing very well. There is a lot of data that supports it. A good model, I have not seen one yet. I can raise serious questions about any model you propose. Uh, but the supposing the continents were lower, this material poured in on the continents, spread, very widespread. Uh, this is what you'd get there during the flood. And you have so many, much more of the sediment on the continents than you have in the ocean. Average thickness of sediments in the ocean is about uh, 300, 400 meters at most. Average thickness of sediments on the continents is about 1,600 meters. It's four times as thick on the sediment. And an awful lot of that is marine. More than half of it is marine. So. You don't have a model where you have present conditions, for instance, de uh, depositing these things in the ocean. Now, keep in mind, folks, the uh, thickness of the sediments over the earth is extremely thin. After I show you all those pictures of the Grand Canyon, you won't believe me. On an average, take an ordinary world globe. The average thickness of the sediments over the world is less than one quarter the thickness of a piece of paper, or sh ordinary sheet, 20 pound uh, weight uh, sheet of paper. It's an extremely superficial thing. We, we, I don't know why our thinking is so vertical and uh, so weak laterally. Uh, but you know, uh, the world, these layers, you look there, and you see all these layers in the Grand Canyon. Now, in the Grand Canyon, they're unusually thick. Okay, this is abnormal to a certain extent. It's not average. Uh, but when you average it all out, a lot of places don't have sediments and so on. Uh, it's an extremely superficial layer that you have there. And the uh, extremely widespread layer, incidentally, where, where you do have them. but. Uh, Compared to the size of the Earth, uh, 
there's not that much sediment out there. It's, it's, it's pretty thin. It's pretty thin type of thing. So uh, uh, could it be that they went in the ocean? Well, the, the, the evidence that they postulate, well, how come we have all this marine mineral on the continents? Oh, the continent sank down. Fine, fine. You guys have moved right into a flood model, folks. When you sink the continents down and you have marine mineral. I'll go, I, I'm, I'm along with you, boy, that's, that's the way they got there. Uh, now there are some models where you have reversal, reversal of continents in the oceans. Uh, Lee Spencer, I think, leans towards that a little bit. Uh, there are some models that some of our scientists in Europe suggest that there was granitization uh, and you had reversal and so on. Uh, sinking is another model. And then there's the expansion model, it's very fascinating. I've, I've never showed you folks these things. You, someday I'll be able to show you the slide. You ought to see. You can take the Earth and you can reduce the diameter down to three fifths of its present size, okay? Take out all the oceans and you can practically fit the continents on the Earth. I mean, you know, North America is against Africa, and so we do plate tectonics, Austria and there. All the oceans are gone. Uh, very fascinating. I can't tell you if that relates to Earth, if it was here before Creation Week, which I think, or if this was related to the third day of Creation Week, or what. But it, it's fascinating stuff. We don't know yet what, on the other hand, there's distribution of uh, about one-third of your continents at the base have marine material on. This seems a little heavy. Where is all that continental material? Uh, I'm a little uneasy with the model of just the continents sinking down and so on. Because of that, nevertheless, uh, I lean towards that because the other models seem more uh, contrived. But we don't know. We don't know that. But we do know that there's tell hey, that past was very different than the present. Very different than the present. In terms of the deposits, the sediments, and what you, you see out there. I, I have a question. Can you go back um, uh, a little ways to the, uh, uh, to your references? Uh, back one beyond that, I think. And I was noticing that if you don't count the bottom one uh, in Origins um, and the Journal of Creation, those top four are all part of the peer-reviewed literature. Um, well, do you think that they would pass muster in a... Uh, if you go to references too, the, other than uh, mine, which is published in Origins also. Um, Let's see, maybe you were here. Yeah, or th or three, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> mutations, uh, Scientific American, uh, if you don't count Sanford, I guess. Uh, A lot of uh, Schweitzer is in mm -hmm. the peer reviewed literature. Most of those things are actually in the peer reviewed uh, literature. Look, folks. Uh, the, the, the peer-reviewed literature presents the facts and uh, then usually an evolutionary interpretation. Uh, I'm so glad the facts are there, folks. Uh, sometimes they don't make any difference between facts and interpretation. And uh, this is very confusing and uh, you need to watch that carefully. But uh, well, the, the data, it, it's a question of interpretation of data. Interpretations. Yeah, and uh, you have, uh, uh, it's there, and you can be a scientist and believe in the flood and believe in the Bible. Even though some will define science, you know, once you put God in there, you're no longer a scientist. Uh, I do not accept that interpreted in si science. To me, is an open search for God. I'm going to try and follow the data wherever it leads. Try and follow the data wherever it leads. Uh, the data of nature. Yeah. Uh, 
Dr. Ariel, uh, I have a question about when the sedimentation rates are calculated in basis of volcanic ash layers between other layers. Uh, well, uh, in other words, the radiometric dating. Yeah. Yeah. There's an article in Science which talks about uh, lava flows in Hawaii. Okay. You've got uh, a lava flow. That lava flow is dated at 15,000 years, okay? Uh, by carbon-14 for one thing, by pelagonite, uh, mineral, uh, weathering, and so on. It looks young. It looks young. Now, the lava flow goes down from shallow to deep, okay? They date the lava flow also by, carb by uh, potassium argon. They get 43 million years for that lower down some intermediate dates between. It's not a very smooth curve, but it, in general, the, dotes, the dates get older down below. How do these, you might say, uh, secular scientists interpret this? They suggest in the article that the pressure of the water at the deeper thing prevented the argon from escaping. So here's a recent flow. It gives gradually older dates. And it's due to the pressure of the water. And this makes sense. You, you know, uh, the, the problem is excess argon in, in this case. Uh, argon, you know, it's got a half-life of 1.26 billion, I think, something around that. 1.26 billion, I think, <coughs> years. Uh, but the atmosphere is 1% argon. And you, you, have, you go into deeper rocks, you can get excess argon that increases. There's another paper, uh, some uh, samples taken in Montana. They got more and more excess argon the deeper they went. They attributed probably to degassing de of the earth. See, so, here we're talking about pressure. Another place we're talking about degassing. There are alternate models to that that are different from the interpretation they put on it. And they, uh, the one they put, of course, is one that fits with the standard uh, thing. So I, I lean more towards, uh, well, let's try and reinterpret this. Now, there are other creationists who think, well, no, maybe the physical constants changed. And uh, decay rates changed. And uh, I respect their, their opinion on that. Uh, I have a very hard time thinking how you can change these constants without upsetting the nature of matter. I mean, you start playing around with these forces of physics, and the whole universe disappears. Oh, I mean, it's, but uh, we don't know very much. They could be right. They could be right. I have a uh, geological question about models, but before I pose the question, <coughs> I want to express my personal appreciation. This, this uh, gives evidence of extensive, extensive research, lifetime of work, and we appreciate it. I would just like to encourage <coughs> others, uh, young people, I don't see any, I see a few that are young. <laughs> Others who have an interest to go into a life work re relative to geology, it can be done. I got a degree in, master's degree in geology. It can be done, and I know you've taken a lot of cl cra class work. We just need a lot more researchers. These are really complicated, challenging questions, and it'll be a team effort to get to the bottom of it. Uh, one of my questions has to do with something that just popped in my mind when going back to when I took geology over 30 <laughs> years ago now. Um, and the question relates to the composition of the crust over the continents versus the crust over the ocean. And I was taught, I think mm -hmm. probably correctly, that the crust in the continents is called Cialic. 
That's an abbreviation mm -hmm. for silicon and aluminum. Mm -hmm. And so you have the two major components of rocks on the continents. We're talking about metamorphic rocks. Of course, they break down into other byproducts, sedimentary. <laughs> but the main composition of the granites, let's say, over the continents would be silicon, which is quite, quite a bit lighter than what you find in the deep oceans. <coughs> the deep oceans, I was taught, were mafic. It's an abbreviation of manganese and ferrous. Sima. Or, Sima is the term they use for it. They use that now. I was yeah. trained differently. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lot of iron and manganese and some of the mm -hmm. heavy minerals. And there's quite a distinct difference. I'm mm -hmm. wondering, how do you get this continental it's crust to get depressed enough for these uh, thousands of feet of layers on top? On top. You know, mm -hmm. I, I find a hard time on cr compression yeah. model. Maybe you can bring us up to date on the well, latest on that. Well, I, I have uh, no question that the flood occurred as a result of a special event at exactly the right time, after the animals had entered the ark, after things were taken care of, uh, and God had to do something to do that. Now, you know, we're less comfortable there, you understand? We're, we're less comfortable in that. In that uh, I like objective data more than I do psychological data. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I feel this way, this type of thing. I, <laughs> and so I, I tend to, uh, but something had to happen to bring that flood on at the right time. And I think God did something like circulating the things so the continent sank down and the ocean floors went up. And you're and saying it may have happened under the crust, maybe a, a change in... Under the crust. Yeah. Yes, definitely under the crust. Change in the pressures and so on. Uh, yeah, interesting. And have done it. Now I can go get back a little more into my naturalistic mode by saying, well, at the end of the flood, the things just came up by themselves, which they would, because your, your average density of your uh, uh, granite and so on is is what, about sediments, so about 2.3 and so on, and your basalt is about 2. Point Don't quote me on those figures. 2.7. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 so the continents would f float up by themselves, you know. It's, it's wishful thinking, I suppose, on my part. But uh, at least there, I'm not invoking the miraculous. But to get the flood started, you got God doing it at the right time. Do we have granites that you are quite certain um, pre-existed the flood, or, or are most of the today's granites a product? Oh, I would of the flood? say most of them did. And they date that way. <laughs> if I can point out something uh, that's important, um, I think it's important to look at what the evidence is for something taking place and not necessarily having to have a mechanism before you believe it. I think that's one of the lessons of the Brett's flood was that uh, his evidence was completely discounted because they couldn't find a mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very clear from you know reading uh, the objections that were raised that this was the major objection. Where did all the water come from? And the point of it is, the evidence was there whether we could explain the water or not. And uh, to refuse to believe that there was a major flood of that kind until we can explain where it came from, I think is a, a mistake in science. If there is evidence that there was massive uh, marine deposits on what are now continents, you have to say that somehow water got f either took stuff that was already there and mixed it up or else took stuff somewhere else, but in any case it took stuff from what were then oceans and spread it out over what are now continents. Mm -hmm. And it's our mm -hmm. job to try to see what we can do to explain it, but to deny that it took place because we can't explain it, it seems to me to be backwards. And there's another example, and that's uh, what is called continental drift. We sometimes call it continental split. Um, we know the continents moved around. They crashed into each other in Africa and, 
and uh, South America were once together. But the exact mechanism, what initiated, what keeps it going, scientists are still baffled, as far as I know. Sure. Yeah, uh, but that doesn't mean you can deny that it took place. Our, uh, well, better let my wife talk. I will be brief. <laughs> uh, do you relate this quote unquote event, whatever it was, to the fountains of the great deep? Because I think we'd think if that was something that happened under the crust, that would be later involved in plate tectonics and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, uh, I th you know, you, you look at the Navajo sandstone, for instance, uh, hardly any fossils in it. It's not the place to go look for fossils if you want to. They found a few uh, tracks, I think, plants, and but compared, that thing's 110,000 square miles. I mean, this is, goes clear from Wyoming to California. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> at least Nevada, I, I'm not absolutely sure on that California thing. It's, I saw it in Nevada the other day. They call it the Aztec uh, in Nevada, but it's, everybody agrees it's an Navajo. Uh, <coughs> type of thing. So you, uh, I wonder if uh, some things like these sandstones that are tend to be free of, of fossils and so on, might have come up from aquifers before the flood. So that when the fountains of the Great Deep broke up, the sand came up with them and spread these layers across uh, as a source for that particular peculiar type of of deposit. That's where at, uh, at, the, at, at the beginning of the flood, probably the activity was from the fountains of the Great Deep where the marine material was buried in the deeper parts of the ocean. Uh, but later on, some of these fountains from aquifers one may have produced the, some of these sandstone layers. It's just a speculation, sorry, pure speculation. It kind of fits nicely with the model. Well, thank you, you folks. Have a good Sabbath. <laughs>